Hello, everyone. Hey. How's it going? Um, yeah, let's get it started. My name is Tom. Um, I am the, I, I'm an open source engineer at a company called TestifySec. Um, we specialize in supply chain security. Um, for, this, uh, for this talk, I am the chief ChatGPT officer. So for any of the ChatGPT generated images um, you see in this talk, that's my contribution. Um, and I'm joined here by Matthias. Hey, I'm Matthias, uh, director of tech with uh, Venify. Uh, with, within Venify, I'm focusing on workload identity. And a big part of that is uh, Spiffy and Spire. And uh, like talking to customers about it and making them excited about it. Yeah, so the title of this talk today is The Story of Crush, the microservice that navigated the cloud native ocean with just a spiffy identity. There's going to be a lot of parallels in this talk between um, things that we see in the cloud native world and um, ocean creature characters that I've come up with. And also, please forgive me, I tried everything I did to remove Finding Nemo references from, from the images, but ChatGPT instantly correlated. Uh, crush the turtle to, well, yeah, copyright infringement. I guess it's like subtly calling me out for the copyright infringement that I've done on this talk. But hopefully, I don't get um, booed by the CNCF or um, sued by, by Pixar. Right, let's get, let's get this get going, started. I suppose. Yeah. So, everybody, meet Crush. Crush is a small turtle shaped microservice alone in a large ocean of other microservices. Nobody trusted poor Crush. In a world where every communication relied on trust, Crush felt outcasted. Even when he tried to talk to other microservices, the other microservices replied with nothing but 403s. Crush felt all alone. Almost as if he was in a Docker container like Fishbowl, with nothing mounted to it to change its fate. Until an enormous elder sea turtle appeared. The ocean is a dangerous place, the elder turtle said. Just like many other distributed systems, the other microservice creatures need to know that you're a trusted part of the environment. But I've tried everything, Little Crush said. I've even tried giving user and Postgres to Pongo the Postgres puffer. You need your own identity, little one, the elder turtle said. Otherwise, you might even find yourself befriending the wrong kind of services. Were you too young to remember that time you met the sidecar shark that shouldn't have been anywhere near you? Elder Turtle was right. That sidecar shark really came out of nowhere. If it wasn't for Gus, the GitOps glassfish, Crush could have been in major trouble. So off Crush went to find its identity. I see it as an identity you seek. Crush had just met Sean, the spire socket shrimp, for the very first time. Yes, the, tur the young turtle responded. Since I first left the development reef, I haven't managed a single network call. Crush the turtle, the shrimp began. The Spire server elder turtle has given me confirmation of your registration. Wow, the elder turtle orchestrates all the workload identities on the reef, Crush asked. Yes, Sean replied. The elder turtle is the root of trust for all identities on the reef. The Elder Turtle can even give us trust bundles of other um, trust domains. But the platform team haven't quite gotten to grips with that yet, Sean sighed. So I hereby bestow upon you an X509 spiffy identity, uh, verifiable identity document known as an SFID for the trust domain of this great reef. An identity card floated through the water into Crush's small flipper. Wow, so now I can have secure communication with everyone? Well, while that's the idea, not really, the shrimp side. The, shrimp side. The, platform team to th the platform team seemed to think that this is the answer to all trust and secure communication throughout production. But in reality, I swear most cloud services that we use don't accept it. And what's possible when talking to some of the older service fish that are swimming around, I really don't know. I dread to think what would happen if you tried speaking with Terence the Tomcat server, Trout, with one of these. Sean then said his goodbyes, sending a customary EOF to Crush before vanishing back into the shadows. I can't wait to start communicating with the rest of the services in production, Crush exclaimed. And I know just who to start with on the list. Crush jumped onto the East Australia current to prepare secure communication with his, uh, with his first 2B pal. Well, with the web server whale, Crush yelled at the top of its lungs. 
Sorry, Crush, you know that's, uh, that this communication is not secure, Wilma groaned. No, look, I have an identity now. Crush took out the SVID and laid it out on a flipper. So now what we're going to do is we're going to stop the story for a moment while Matthias shows us a little demo of what a spiffy ID or an SVID looks like. Yep, uh, and so I'm not the greatest prompt engineer, so the demos are not going to be like this animated. <laughs> but what I have done in advance is I've created a simple uh, microservice application that's going to be representing Crush. Uh, it's a call it customer. And um, I kind of just I'm retrieving, and I'm going to showcase the code in here. Uh, here is the code. And what this does is this connects to the workload API socket. And it's then going to fetch, fetch all my X509 SFITs from the workload API socket. And I'm uh, putting them into variables and into a map so that I then, then can uh, visualize them. And I'm now going to a website, uh, this one. And this shows me all of the details of my uh, workload API socket. So if I do a refresh, you will see in here in the logs on the right hand side calls coming in. So this is my customer application, which is representing uh, my uh, microservice. And what you can see in here is like some details of, the, um, of, of my uh, application. Uh, first and foremost, we have our Spiffy identity. It's represented by this. I have deployed uh, Spire on my Kubernetes cluster. It's a Kubernetes cluster running in uh, Google Cloud. And I have um, kind of done a quite simple Helm chart deploy of uh, Spire with very little modification. You can also see it set some extra DNS names. And especially later on, this is going to be useful to do some extra things, as you might see. You can also see all of my certificates are really short-lived. Uh, uh, all my times are UTC time, so it's uh, 11 uh, PM there. And oh, 11 PM, it got almost uh, issued. And it's valid until like uh, almost 3 AM uh, the next day, so for five hours. My certificate is valid, and then it uh, retrieves a new one. And this is representing Crush, the microservice. So we've seen Crush, the microservices, SVID. Um, and now we're going to continue on with, onwards with our secure, potentially secure communication with Wellma, the web service well. Well, isn't that marvelous, Wellma said. When I was born, I was lucky enough to have been programmed to be able to use my X509 Spiffy ID to create an encrypted communication channel with other compatible services. Should we try it out? Hopefully, you should be programmed this way too. Cool. Now we're going to introduce Walmart the Whale as a microservice. And uh, this is done uh, by a new microservice called the backend. And this is a normal Golang web server. And one of the things that I want to highlight in here, it's almost like a normal HTTPS web server you would spin up with Golang. And like very little modification is actually needed to spiffify your applications. So the way this works is uh, in this first bit, we are again. Uh, setting our, uh, getting our source from the workload API socket. We are also saying which client IDs, which PFI identities are allowed to talk to our backend because like, we want to make sure that like, not all PFI IDs are uh, authorized to talk to our web server, but only like, specific ones. And in this case, for the purpose of this demo, I really have like, set it to like, only the customer application or CRUST, the microservice can talk to uh, this web server. And then uh, I'm putting this all in an HTTPS server config and uh, adding all of this and starting my server with listen and serve TLS. And that's kind of it. Like this is now has spiffified my application. Um, when the web service get called, we have a simple root handler. What this does is it first uh, get, gives a message with successfully connected to the backend service and it adds the time of the current time to it. So, and, and the way this then represents into Crush and what Crush has to do, again, Crush talks to uh, the workload API socket to, again, get its own identity. We are also going to say for Crush, you can only talk to well, Mother Wheel, or the backend service in this case. We're also building up our uh, MTLS client config, as you would no do a normal MTLS client config if you, if you would do that. And we are adding our spiffy bits uh, in here with that one. And like we are making our connection uh, here with a get the data from it. If you have any problems, we're returning any errors. 
and we are then showcasing this in our uh, website. And this translates to the following. So I'm going now to first show the logs of uh, Spiffy backend. So I'm watching the logs of the Spiffy backend, and I have a simple like website with all different buttons that are going to do the actions of today. And we're going to start with the Spiffy native uh, MTLS action, and I'm going to click this. And you can see here, I have logged, got a response from Spiffy Spire, and it showcases the Spiffy backend. So on Crash, the microservices also know like who I talk to. On um, the backend, you can also see that it has identified that it's coming from the customer, and it has responded for with this message, and this match this one. If I press the button again, it does a new call, and uh, it updates this. But what if you have like a rogue customer? So I have deployed the same microservice, it's actually the same microservice with the same credentials, but with a different identity. So when I now am going to do is I'm going to repeat this call and doing Spiffy native MTLS. And you see I'm getting an error back with a bad certificate. So even though this identity is part of the same trust domain, because I'm literally saying like only Crush can be authorized to talk to me, this still gets denied and it still gets the bad certificate back, even though like they have the same root of trust. And you can see this is being locked here. Uh, and this is the identity of my rogue issuer. Uh, I literally call it rogue for simplicity. Okay. So we've just seen Crush speaking to Welma, the microservice whale, successfully with using uh, Spiffy, uh, Spiffy's native um, libraries in Go uh, to configure the web services appropriately. Yeah. Um, we'd, as we'd expect, that works absolutely fine. And there are other great libraries out there. You can do this in Java. Java has a library. Uh, I know Python has a library. So like most popular uh, programming languages by now have like libraries for kind of spiffifying your applications. So even for Terence, the Tomcat server, there is hope. Yep. There is hope still. Isn't that awesome, Welma said. Now that we both have spiffy IDs from the same trust domain, we can talk to each other all the time. And don't worry, Crush, it's only you I trust. Any rogue services won't be able to talk to me because their spiffy ID URI will be different, Welma reassured Crush. And on that note, Crush flew back into the current, off towards the next 2 b pal. However, this time, Crush's confident wasn't quite so high. Maurice, the mainframe Moorish idolfish, saw Crush swimming into the periphery. Whilst letting out a sigh, Maurice already couldn't be bothered with trying to listen to what this young hit microservice had to say. Hey, Maurice, do you know what Spiffy is? Crush asked. Crush, I was written in COBOL before your parents were born, Maurice gloated. If it ain't with the IBM Resource Access Control Facility, I ain't budging. Crush realized that this was a conversation that wasn't going to end well and glided off into the distance. Clarence, the cleaning shrimp server, stood before Crush, clicking his jaws jubilantly. However, that is the only way that poor Clarence could communicate. Crush turned around to see an octopus floating above them. I'm Erica the Envoy Octopus, said the red creature. Poor Clarence was written in PHP. He doesn't know what Spiffy is, Erica continued. But there is good news. That is why I'm here to help, young Crush. But how does that work, Crush replied, feeling confused. I am configured to handle requests on behalf of, of Clarence here. Ha hand me your SVID, and I will ensure that it is trusted. If all is well, I'll make sure I send on your request to Clarence. Wow. Thank God you're here, Erica. Crush chuckled. Let's give this a try. Cool. Now we're going to Envoy proxy demo. So uh, first, I'm going to showcase the code again. So I have like a simple HTTP service. And um, there's not much to say. Like I have a handler in here in the same way as I had a handler in my MTLS native application. And I'm starting this time on HTTP listen and serve. So no HTTPS. Uh, the handler in here of the information I'm getting back is the same as the previous service, just for uh, simplicity's sake. But 
It's a simple HTTP server, so it can be everything. This is written in Go as like that I know best, uh, but like can be any language. Even if you buy like enterprise products, it can be that. And what I've done is in the deployment, um, and now I'm going to the deployment, I have configured Envoy as a sidecar container. You can see Envoy being configured here. And that has mounted in an Envoy config, and uh, we're going to take a look at that quite closely, as well as uh, the Spiffy workload API. And uh, it's also configured to be served on uh, port 8080. Um, uh, that's my uh, Spiffy HTTP backend, and my container port is, is 9001. So when I go to my config map, and this is like an Envoy config, and you can look at that as like, what is still would configure on your behalf, but I've now actually configured this uh, myself, and you can do that as well. You don't necessarily need Istio for this. It's uh, first and foremost, and it's, it's a bit templated in with uh, Helm, uh, but this is actually going to request to the SDS, uh, the secure secret data storage kind of thing. So like, it's going to talk to the workload API and it's going to request this uh, specific Spiffy certificate. So like, this is going to re be requesting the HTTP, ba HTTP backend uh, Spiffy certificate. When I scroll down a bit more in the config, you will see in here that it's going to do some validation context and it's going to match the type subject alternative names with like the URI and it's going to match this with our customer um, Spiffy identity. So Envoy is for us going to do the authorization on behalf of our HTTP uh, microservices. So it's not only going to put MTLS in front of it, it's also going to do the authorization for us. And then a bit further down in the config, uh, we are saying this is the trust domain and uh, where it can find also like the SDS uh, socket, which is part of the Spiffy workload API. And we are serving like this as well over uh, port 8080. Um, so, when I now go to my application, I'm going to showcase the logs of the Spiffy HTTP backend in this case, and they are going to be a bit longer as it's Envoy logs. So I'm now going back to here, and I say like Spiffy with Envoy and an HTTP backend. So from Crash, the Microsoft's perspective, it's just a normal MTLS call. So like we saw earlier the MTLS call that it did for the Spiffy native backend. For the HTTP backend, it's actually the exact same call. And there's nothing needs to be changed. So like because Crash is Spiffy native, it does like handle the HTTP backend as it would be Spiffy native as well, only Envoy is in front of it. So when I do this again, what we will see, and I always need to look into the logs in here, we can see that it has matched this with like the Spiffy customer one, and it does all of the validation. And to showcase that the validation works, I'm going again to my rogue application, and I'm going to repeat this call. And again, I'm getting like the failed one. And you can see in here uh, that it's a connection verify failed because the Spiffy identity didn't match. So we are again protecting our workloads, and we are able to verify uh, everything in there. Okay, awesome. On with the story. <laughs> Yet another successful request. I'm on a roll, shouted Crush. Now I better find the crabs. Tokens, please. Santiago, the S3 bucket crab, blocked Crush's path. For access to the bucket, Crush needs the token. Santiago, the S3 crab, was different to others. Santiago only accepts tokens as a form of authentication. Unless Crush wanted to exchange an X509 SVID for AWS credentials with Angus the AWS Anywhere Anglerfish, feel free to uh, research AWS Anywhere further out with this story. Um, but yeah, unless he wanted to, to speak to Angus, Crush would have to find another way of getting a token. The poor platform team just didn't have time to configure Angus to perform such magic. Crush felt all hope was lost until Sean the Spire Socket server, uh, sorry, Sean the Spire Socket shrimp reappeared. You can request the token from me, Crush, Sean lamented. Please note, though, that conversely to X509 SVIDs, JWT SVIDs must be minted directly from the Elder Turtle Spire server in real time. 
please proceed with caution. Go forth with your token, though. Just make sure not to give it to untrusted parties, Sean warned. Yes, the token. We love the token. Now I authorize you to make requests to my bucket, Antonio chuckled. And without further ado, another demo. Yes, and now we're going into AWS S3 connection with .sfit. I explained earlier already that my Kubernetes cluster is running in GKE, so it's Google Cloud, but I want to talk to uh, AWS. So as part of my uh, Spire setup, what I've done is I have configured an OIDC endpoint, which is publicly available, and which then can be used by external services to verify uh, the JOT keys that I get issued uh, to my applications. And uh, this is like the well-known path uh, that like, is of an OIDC endpoint. And I have configured this in uh, AWS. I'm going to log on a bit, but like this is my OpenID Connect uh, configuration. And I'm trying to see where, where it is. Uh, this is the provider uh, that's configured. And it has like everything set up. And then what I've done is I've created a role. It's called the demo spiffy uh, role. And this has uh, permissions to do S3 requests to two buckets, the, uh, to, to a bucket, the Matthias Piffy demo bucket. And if I go to the trust relationship, in here it's set up that it needs to use the federated ARN that I uh, was showing earlier with my OIDC one, but it's also going to do the verification again of the Spiffy ID, and I'm going to make this a bit bigger, that it's like better readable, and here you can see this. So we have the audience set to demo, so you can add audiences to your chat requests, and uh, in this case I'm doing demo, and it's also going to match this on the sub, which is my Spiffy identity uh, that I've given. And that's how you, again, like you can do fine-grained access control to like cloud providers because like you can really add the spiffy identity to your cloud provider roles and like do the matching based on that one. And I think I'm right in saying that in this case, it supports wildcarding for if you wanted to say yep. like anything within a particular namespace or something like that. Yeah. And so this like, I have the permissions to uh, write, read from S3, from my S3 bucket and I have set up the trust relationship between the role and uh, the federation thing. I also have like an S3 bucket demo. Uh, I'm going to refresh to showcase that it's fully empty. And before actually doing the demo, I'm quickly taking you through the code and how this works. So I have AWS set up and actually it's, it's fairly simple code and from a, a code perspective, it's like you would be running uh, your application as natively in AWS. So like in the code itself, there is nothing that really hints towards Spiffy or Spire. So it's set up like a new session with the AWS config. I have added a region in here that I want to talk to. Uh, and then I'm creating a new S3 instance and I'm getting an object, for example. And I'm reading this out and, and showcasing this and you will see this in a bit. So in the code itself, there is nothing like that points to S3 or to Spiffy Spire better. So you might ask how this works and uh, to be able to showcase this. I've added a small extra, even when I go to the Docker file uh, of my application, I've, besides my Spiffy demo uh, binary, I've also added uh, a binary called Spiffy AWS Assume role. Uh, it's something originally created by uh, Square and, and they have publicly blocked about it, so definitely check that out. And this can then be used in conjunction with your uh, AWS config. So, I have like added an entry point with an init container uh, to my customer application. And what this does is it creates an AWS config file and it's going to uh, create a default profile and it's going to set the credential process. So like that's something that AWS by default has and when you're requesting uh, an AWS credential, it will see this line and it will then run the following binary and what this binary does is make sure that it requests it from the Spiffy API socket, and it's going to form the chat token in the right way so that it can be presented to AWS and you get authenticated and authorized to AWS. So you can see the credentials. You need to give the role that you're going to assume, so the role you saw earlier in AWS. You need to set the audience, which is demo in this case, and you need to give like where your workload API socket is. And the way this gets done is through an init container you can see uh, this is the init container that gets run, 
And uh, we have like the AWS config file mounted as a volume mount. So this is like an in-memory one. And then uh, my Spiffy customer application consumes this. And uh, one of the things I had to do extra is set two environment variables, and it's this. And these are no common AWS SDK environment variables. So like every AWS SDK is aware of these. And that's the AWS config file, where the config file can be found, as well as it no needs to load that config file. And that's all that needs to be done. So when I now go to my application back, first, I'm going to show that when I retrieve a file from an S3 bucket, it's going to give an error, because my S3 bucket is empty. When I now do a write of the file to S3 bucket, uh, it has successfully uploaded a test file to my uh, Packet. And when I'm now going to do a refresh in here, we can see the test file has appeared. And when I retrieve the file again, we now have this content that is getting retrieved from uh, that file. If I do this again with my rogue application, so retrieve from a file from an S3 bucket, it gets denied. So even though like it had the same, it was assume and everything set up because I have limited the AWS role to a specific Spiffy identity. My rogue uh, identity cannot like, assume that role and, and then also execute against it and do any S3 actions. OK, so on with the tour. My first network call to a public cloud service. So cool. Crush was on top of the world. You can authenticate to many other services just like this, Antonio said. You can even authenticate to GCP like this, but they don't quite support um, X509 SVIDs just yet, Antonio smirked. Huh, not according to Gerald the GKA jellyfish, Crush said. Oh well, maybe that's a new feature. At least we'll make loads of money on egress charges, said Antonio. <laughs> evil, evil Antonio. <laughs> Exhilarated by the rush of being able to read from an S3 bucket for the very first time, Crush was ready for the next network call. An elderly microservice turtle stood in the way of Crush as he, as he was wandering through the reef. Hey kid, name's Malvin, the elder turtle said. The project manager told the development team that I ain't worth evolving, Malvin said. Don't worry Malvin, I'm sure the development team could use my source code as prior art for yours, Crush said optimistically. Crush, I'm a Perl web server written by a solo dev. I'm not even sure what happened to that guy because I haven't been changed since 2009, Melvin said. <laughs> I haven't even had so much as a security patch since I was shoved into a container and deployed to Kubernetes five years ago. My days are numbered, pal, but I wish you the best of luck with your new identity. Melvin skulked off into his home. Crush had only one more service to visit, one that many requests had been made in the past but to no avail. Pongo, the PostgreSQL puffer, stared longingly into young Crush's eyes. Poor Pongo had been by far the best to Crush in the days of no identity, but still had been unable to help. I have an identity, Pongo, announced Crush. How exciting, replied Pongo. I'm hoping that you can now see me as an authorized user. I'm so excited to know all the exciting things you hold in your tables, Crush said. All you need to do is validate the Spiffy, the Spiffy ID inside, my, inside the SVID, and that, um, and that is in the URI SAN. Then you can trust me and send me data with MTLS. Oh, crush, Pongo said. I wish I could make this easier for you, but I'm afraid I'm not natively able to read Spiffy IDs, continued Pongo. However, there is still a way. Pongo sounded a bit brighter. Really? Any way is better than nothing. Let's do it, Pongo. Crush was getting excited. Essentially, I do actually have um, an X509 SVID myself, Pongo started. But I'm not actually a Spiffy native application. I have a Spiffy helper sidecar that helps me get my SVID. And then we can talk with MTLS. However, I'm not able to inspect the Spiffy ID in the URI SAN of the X509 certificate. I can only inspect the common name. This means that while I'm able to inspect your SVID, I can only read the common name field and not the URI SAN. 
The Elder Turtle Spy server is configured to only show uh, your server's account in the common name and not other information, like the namespace you reside in or even the trust domain. Oh, Crush muttered. I think that will be OK, though, provided you're happy with that, Crush asked. Well, this is as good as I can do, so it's good enough for me, said Pongo. Let's give it a try. Cool. Last demo of today. Uh, so we're now going to showcase PostgreSQL with the Spiffy helper. And um, as Tom already explained, uh, PostgreSQL uh, is not aware of Spiffy. So uh, we are, can use X509 as fits, but we are going to use the CN. And as you can see in here, it has set this to Spiffy customer. Uh, you can add these DNS entries when you are registering your workloads. Uh, registering workloads can either be done manually or through automated processes, like you have the Spiffy controller manager for Kubernetes. That's what I'm using, so that's why it's uh, translated to the, um, to the server account, as that's the default that it takes. And for the purpose of this demo, this was more than uh, good enough. But indeed, for your production setups, you might want to go to something more specific. Uh, what I actually had to do to get this up and running is I've run PostgreSQL, and next to it I've run the Spiffy helper as a sidecar container. Um, to PostgreSQL I had to make very little changes, and, and more on that in a bit, and uh, the Spiffy helper. And they share a volume in memory where then the certificates get exchanged between. And to showcase how like the Spiffy helper works, I'm immediately going into the config file of the Spiffy helper. And what you are saying there is like when the Spiffy helper comes up, it connects to the workload API socket. It's going to retrieve the Spiffy SFIT, and it's going to write this to a specific uh, file, uh, uh, folder that you've, you've set, uh, in this case, opt PostgreSQL search, and it's going to name the files with a specific name, in this case, the SFIT file name, uh, and, and everything around here. And because PostgreSQL is not able to automatically detect file changes, as like our SFITs are really short-lived, our certificates are very short-lived, only five hours. We need to make PostgreSQL aware, like, hey, there are new certificates. And this is being done uh, by these two lines after the uh, new certificate files have been written. Uh, we are telling PostgreSQL to reload its config and thus become aware of the new uh, certificates. And uh, on the PostgreSQL side, I then had to enable SSL. Um, I also had to make uh, I, had, I did a few things to make it very easy to get PostgreSQL up and running. First of all, it's like when PostgreSQL initially comes up, it creates a database called testdb. That's where we're going to write to. I'm also creating a Spiffy user, and you can see this is a very secure password, but we're not using the password, so like, I don't care about this too much for this, for, for this part. And I'm creating a table and uh, granting select. And you might ask, why do I don't care about like the... Um, password that I've set here is when I go to my uh, HPA config, and that's how you tell to PostgreSQL how to do authentication. Uh, you're, I'm saying here, uh, everything that comes in from the public needs to do certificate authorization. So you can only do certificate authorization, and not username and password. And um, how this looks like on the side of Crash is I have two methods. I have uh, a PostgreSQL retrieval handle, uh, handler as well as a put handler. But it's a set of PostgreSQL connection that has all of the spiffy bits. So if you have like an application that makes lots of PostgreSQL connections, you can really abstract this away into like one method and, and, and do this once. And it's a bit the same as like initially with the MTLS call. Uh, we are getting uh, our um, certificate from the workload API. Uh, in this case, on crash side, we are hacking, like we're doing authorize any, but you can further uh, limit this. But for the purpose of this demo, I did this. And then it has like the normal connection string request to PostgreSQL. And um, you can see here that I'm doing the connection string. I'm adding here the MTLS bits for uh, Spiffy. And I'm opening the database with that config file. And I'm pinging this kind of thing to make sure that everything is, is correctly set up. And then uh, for the input, I am generating some random names and also the date and time. And I'm inserting this. And then uh, for retrieval, I'm just retrieving that whole, whole uh, table. So when I'm now going to uh, PostgreSQL, I'm going to write to PostgreSQL. And you can see in here, it states inserted successfully. And I'm quickly, and I'm doing this again. So 
I now have two records inserted. So when I now do retrieve from PostgreSQL, it has a few more because I did some tests earlier. But you can see these are like the last two names I've inserted and uh, they've been doing. And I'm able to do like these PostgreSQL calls. When I do this with my Rogue application, when I try to retrieve, PostgreSQL denies this because it doesn't, isn't aware of the Spiffy identity and it's not allowing the connection in. And this is all happening based on the common name. So even though you cannot really use the Spiffy identity of it, you can at least switch to shortlist certificates for this one that are issued by your Spire server and, and make this work. And, and this is kind of showcasing that even in hybrid approaches, you can still use Spiffy and Spire without any problems. OK, awesome. One of the more obscure ones, um, but nonetheless a way around forward. Yeah. OK, let's wrap this up. Finally, Crush began. I can now speak to you, Pongo, but also to a large selection of other services all across production. Crush had been on the best journey yet. After a long day holding its breath, Crush came up for air and took a quick glance over at the beautiful Seattle skyline. According to Rhonda, the RSS Rockfish, there's even a security conference on. Cool. While not everything had gone perfectly, Crush could now at least have a way of hopefully keeping the same identity for life. With time, more and more services in the ocean would support it as a means of secure communication. And hopefully, even uh, services in other reefs, such as GCP Reef and maybe even Azure Reef, will come together to make the ocean one big, friendly, secure place. Thank you very much. If you'd like to take a look at the source code that Matthias um, brilliantly wrote for, this, for all the demos, please take a look at the QR code that's on the top right. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, hope, hopefully that was entertaining. And yeah, thank fun. you all.